I, I want to welcome you to today's edition of The Bradley Hall Show. And I am your host, The Bradley Hall. Okay, I want to share something with you that I am really excited about. My new course, The Role of Meditation in Holistic Healing, is available now. In this course, I explore more about the history of meditation as well as the proven healing properties and benefits of meditation. I share with you various medical and scientific studies and experiments that are corroborating what gurus and mystics have known for thousands of years, that meditation is actually an integral part of holistic healing. Plus, for a limited time, I have thrown in 10 free guided meditations at the end of the course. So don't delay. Let's get started on your healing journey now. Go to www.lifeintruthacademy.com to register. Plus, go right now and use the code April 2020. That's all uppercase letters, all one word, April 2020, to receive $20 off. That is over 50% of the normal tuition rate. But don't delay. This is for a limited time, and you are worth it. All right. Hi. Welcome back. This is uh, The Bradley Hall. This is The Bradley Hall Show. Today, my guest is an, an old friend of mine. I hate using the word old, but uh, we've known each other, I think, about 30-some years. We, uh, we go way back. Uh, our paths split a little bit throughout the years. We reconnected on Facebook. And uh, as the world would have it, we ended up having a lot in common. I think we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, his, his name is Forrest Fall. Forrest is a yoga instructor here in Southwest Florida, and he's agreed to join me today to talk about a little bit about his story, how uh, yoga has been part of his path uh, to recovery and healing, and uh, why he does what he does and what he thinks the, how, how yoga can help you. So. Uh, welcome, Forrest. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. No, I appreciate to be here. Good, good. So, um, you know, this is a uh, this is like I, I told you a minute ago. This is our fifth episode. We're uh, we're happy to have you here. The first couple had a uh, had a specific theme, but um, we're, we're moving off track a little bit. But it still incorporates the things that I've been wanting to talk about which is uh, holistic healing, things that, uh, you know, things that help people get better. And I know that, um, I know this has been a primary focus of yours uh, over the last couple of years as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the thing, I guess, really what I have learned over the last couple of years, um, you know, my business motto is changing lives and teaching yoga. But I think what I learned was I'm really not going to change their life. I'm just going to give them relief. What they do based upon the relief that I offer them, a lot of times, yes, their life is changed. But it's really all in the hands of the person to change their life. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's interesting. Right out of the gate, we we have, uh, we you hit a, a commonality. We both, I, I feel the same way you do, that, I'm not a big fan of anyone that says they can cure you or uh, fix you or anything like that. First of all, I don't think that we're all broken. I, I, I think every I think everybody's broken. I think everybody's broken. So if everybody's broken, then everyone's normal. And I and I truly believe that. And what it does is sets us on our own path. But I think that uh, I'm a real big fan of self care and self healing. And uh, we certainly we certainly have that in common. It sounds like so. Uh, Absolutely. Tell me. If you would, um, let's kind of set the backstory. I, I know a little bit of it. I, I you know I know uh, more about you than the listeners. But what what kind of set this up? Tell me how. Tell me a little bit about your story and how you ended up finding yoga and alternative therapies. So it really it kind of started just moving to Florida. Um, you know, being in the dark hole with my demons and thinking, oh well, let's let's move somewhere else things would get better and it did get better for a little while and then I noticed that I was going back to the same old less effective ways of dealing with life let's just put it that way 
and other friends or I call family members. I call her my village sister. She uh, she kept saying, you know, hey, you need to check out this place called Veterans Alternative. You need to check them out, see what they have for you. Um, and it's a nonprofit organization that provides alternative therapies for combat vets. So I called them, and the day that they I, I called them, they were actually having a gentle yoga and IRS class. And so I, I joined, and I was like, here I am. Uh, you know, they say it's good for me. And, and I didn't know what happened. I just knew that there was a shift. Um, couldn't explain it. So I decided to make a, a dedicated commitment to practice one to two days a week. And that's all I, that's the only change I had made in my life. And my my friends and close family or close friends and family, they were like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. That's awesome. Um, which it eventually led to four classes, to actually go into yoga studios to do classes, uh, four classes a week, I would say. So then somebody saying, oh, you should be a teacher. And I said, oh, no, I, I could never practice anything but gentle yoga, let alone be a teacher. And then probably a month or two after telling somebody that, um, I was invited to a teacher training weekend that happened to be a a, 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 a power based, a traditional power based yoga practice called Ashtanga Yoga. Okay. And I didn't last very long, but then it was like, you know what? this gentle yoga and I rest has done something for me. What about this traditional power stuff that I'm really getting a workout from and I'm not sure about, but let me try it. And then next thing I know, my teacher says, well, you are going to go to teacher training. And I said, well, I can't afford it. And she goes, we'll just show up. We'll figure it out. And I was able to pay her back. Um, and I could sum up really all of that and what yoga has done for me in kind of one sentence that before yoga, I really had no purpose or meaning. And after yoga, my life is filled with purpose and meaning in every aspect of it, not just what I provide to the community, but even more than that, just with my family, my friends, and just relationships with people in general. That's, uh, that's a pretty incredible testimony. It's very, very powerful. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that the way you did. Um, you know, I've, I've seen... I've seen your transformation from afar, knowing that we had a, a parallel shift, uh, that we had, that our shifts were parallel, you know, that we were headed in the right, the same direction, very similar direction. And, and knowing, uh, from knowing you a long time, I've, I've watched this, this shift happen and it's, it's remarkable. And Michelle and I have talked about you several times because of the things that I go through with, with my journey, uh, that I've gone through with my journey, which you, you know a little bit about that. Um, but, um, so it's been really, it's been really cool to watch you knowing what I know and what I'm going through to see someone else on, on a different path to look over and see it, someone I know on a different path, enjoying the same, the same benefits has been, uh, has been very rewarding. I have to say that seriously. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I was, uh, looking at. I had to reorient. Everything's fluid, as you know, and with what's going on in the world right now. And so I'm in there changing my yoga schedule. And I sat for a moment. I had to think about that. And I'm like, even still today, if I threw out there that I'm teaching six classes a week and eight class, and I'm gonna, it's going to be added or bumped up to eight in two weeks, for somebody who's been teaching less than two years, it's still quite a bit of what I've done and it's crazy though because then the ego comes in and says well you still haven't done enough yeah if that makes sense oh yeah and that's where I think a lot of times we get caught up in we think oh well I'm not egotistical but yet you really are because you think well it was me yeah and I know I've gone off on a left field on there but it kind of ties everything together as well because we need that ego to drive us, but sometimes it drives us the wrong way. Yeah, that's actually um, that's actually a very good point. That is uh, in in psychology that's referred to as the inner critic, and uh, which is a which is a, uh, a symptom. It's a byproduct of um, of trauma, and the the 
the ego turns in a different direction in an attempt to protect us, it beats us down to not, so we don't go out and try new things and further embarrass ourselves and further hurt ourselves. And it actually becomes very counterproductive. And it's a very, very common thing. Uh, it's something that I have always battled with uh, as well. And I address it in a lot of my uh, clients. My, I'm a trauma recovery coach and I address that in a lot of my clients. And then the further extension of that is obviously the whole, the whole ego thing, which a lot of people, uh, half the people who listen to this may, may have experienced that and understand that and half of them it may be new. Um, but maybe we can get into that a little bit later. I want to ask you real quick. Um, I, I want to go back to the beginning. You, you mentioned that when you moved to Florida, um, you got into a, a program, uh, through the VA system or for, for veterans. So, um, I know the beginning of your story is a little bit. It was a nonprofit organization. Um, the VA, I think their hands are tied a lot with laws, yeah. but they realize that nonprofits can provide some of these other alternative therapies. They're starting yeah. to bring other programs in, but it's a slow, slow process. Yeah. Um, I've done some research here recently on yoga and the modern day yoga. And there was just wasn't enough research done on it. You would have one person that would recover from diabetes, say, but yet there was still no long-term research and they wouldn't actually track it anyway. They just found one person and it cured. And this is probably type two of diabetes, but then they didn't try to pursue that anymore. So there was no research. And you think about it, what, what does in today's society, we want that research. We want to know what does it do for us? And, and yeah. we know, you and I both know what living healthy and mindfully and things do for you, but if without the research, you know, it, nobody really wants to take it serious. Yeah, well, and, and unfortunately, we have to, you're absolutely right, and unfortunately, we have to come to a point where we understand that the human psyche is so complex that we can't, it can't be measured literally linearly we it just it can't and medicine has been trying to do that um and done a very good job of it but it's leaving out specific elements especially when we get into um into the mind and mental and behavioral therapy and that kind of thing there's just a, a limited there's a ceiling on it that limits what you can do if you're trying to keep it in that box which is we're seeing now with, you know, they call it alternative therapies. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is uh, famous. He's a physician who uh, created the uh, mindfulness-based um, stress reduction program through meditation. And they've done a lot of studies about meditation that's doing these healing, doing a lot of healing uh, that can be backed up with MRIs. You still can't really, you can't really contain it, but there, you know, technology has helped them be able to, at least show that we can make progress, even if we don't, we don't know why. Yeah. So. Well, you know, speaking of the mind, I mean, cause the ego and the mind, they, they're, they're kind of like close cousins, I call them because the mind thinks it and then ego runs with it. Right. And, and so what we have gone to though, and I don't know who it was. I think therefore I am. Uh, whatever that quote comes from or whatever, but actually I think it's the opposite. I am, therefore I think, because yeah. if I wasn't alive, I wouldn't be thinking. That's so right. I need to think, but I think what happens is my mind, and, I, and a lot of us as America, or even just as people in general, we let our minds just go and go and go, and we don't feel into what we're experiencing. We think that as long as we think what we're experiencing, it's good. But no, we need to feel it. What does it feel like? And the thing is, and then we get into, we can go into it even deeper and like, well, I don't want to have the bad feelings. Well, you know what? That's part of being human. That's right. And, and so take all of it together. And then when you realize that, well, wait a minute, if I take the bad and the good, it's all the same. It's just more effective or less effective, not bad or good. Yeah. Yeah, I, the analogy I use um, with that for us is that you are in a burning building and you have to get out. And the only way out is the door and the fire is between you and the door. You have two choices. You can hide in the corner and you can sit and wait for the fire to consume you. Or you can turn around and you can run through the fire to get out of the burning building. And I, this is exact analogy I use for this situation when people 
try to not confront the truth, which is, which is exactly what I had to do uh, 15 years ago. And um, I had a lot of childhood trauma that was following me around and it was disruptive. The thoughts, um, the constantly streaming thoughts. The other thing that you, you didn't mention was um, the, these thoughts, they're, they're just thoughts. They're not necessarily real. That the energy right. we give them makes them real. And we get, we did get to decide whether we believe them or not. So just because a thought tells you you can't do this or you're not good enough, that's just a thought. Maybe it's a thought that someone, something someone told you when you were little or in middle school that, that you, you adopted and you decided to believe that, but it doesn't necessarily make it true, make it true. And people, this is where awareness comes in, right? Right. So meditation, awareness yoga that, yes. yeah, brings the awareness that you start to realize these thoughts that are constantly running through your head and that you don't have to believe all of them. You can pick and choose. And when you start to step back, something magical begins to happen. You begin to feel liberated because you begin to control your thoughts rather than your thoughts controlling you. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the biggest the biggest problem that people have or they think that, oh, I can't meditate or whatever, do you because I can't stop my thoughts. Well, you don't want to stop your thoughts. Yeah. I tell them maybe to start you want them as a low royal or in the back or maybe like a like, you know, background noise. Because the thoughts are still going to happen. That's right. But then when we start to feel, if you can, you can't think and feel at the same time, you, your mind's going to try to, but, yeah. if we, but what happens if you let the mind keep thinking, then yes, you quit feeling. But if you say, no mind, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you run. Let me go back to feeling and don't judge it. Just say, Hey, that's what happened. Right. It happened. Eventually what's going to happen is the mind's going to get tired of playing that game and be like, okay, well, let's do the feel game. Is what I tell people. Yeah, yeah. Now, how long does that take? It may take you the rest of your life to do that. And there's days where I can come in and just feel my whole body, and I feel, and I'm great. And there's days I go down to sit down and meditate, and my mind does not stop. But you know what? They were all great meditation practices. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And and I want to I, I want to point out with what you said because the mind's job is not to feel. The mind's job is to interpret. And so it wants to interpret whatever you're feeling as good or bad. It's always trying to assess the damage, how thing, whether we're going to be hurt, whether we're not going to be hurt, whether this is great, whether this is terrible. And we don't realize how judgmental we really are. And I don't mean that necessarily in the negative connotation that, that people use or, or, or that people normally think about it when they're like, oh, you're so judgmental. That when we think it's a constant judgment on every single thing that we think about, we're making an assumption and an interpretation about how that fits into our lives and you can't and you can't be analytical and and feel and be emotional at the same time is it, which is exactly what you're saying well yeah i mean because if i if i have a situation that's going on and i let my mind run through it it won't stop but if i have a situation going on and i just feel through it eventually I'm going to get through it and I'm going to be okay. And my mind's going to, it may, I, I may have had let it thought or let it go and do its process. Or it may have just said, Hey, let's see what feeling is like. Yeah. And so, and when you, and you think about feeling, there's more than just, you can think of it in your gut. Where do you feel it in your head? Where do you feel it in every part of your body? You think about it. If you really think about it, what does this situation, how do I feel from head to toe when I go through it? Yep. And then one of the practices I do, which helps me kind of stay in it, what's the opposite of that? Like you said, the opposite of going through the burning, the, to the outside of the burning building is to go in the corner and do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just so, let the fire consume you. Right. And there's, what does it feel like to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. then you realize what's more effective and what's not, because they're both solutions. You can't deny that they're both solutions. I'm not going to say one's good or bad, because think about it. If you go through that fire, you're going to, you're going to consume or have some pain or suffering that's going to be involved with it. Right. So they're both solutions. It's just that what, which one is going to be more, you know, what do you think is more effective? 
Yeah. And that, you know, I can't make that decision for somebody. That's right. That's absolutely right. You know, it, this kind of, um, it, this gets into the whole, the hero's journey. You know, the hero, in every story of the hero, the hero goes through a phase where he tries to run from who he is throughout the story. Maybe runs away, he's pushed away, whatever. He doesn't want to go back because it feels his obligation. Eventually, he realizes what his destiny is, and he has to come back, and he has to face the monster. He has to face the dragon. He has to face the nemesis, and he has to overcome the dragon, or the, the monster. And then when he does, he reaps the rewards, and he inherits the kingdom. And the hero's journey in every single aspect of Hollywood, whether it's The Lion King or Lord of the Rings, it doesn't matter. The story is, is about, uh, about the individual, about individuation, about this journey that we're talking about. And the only way to get on the other side of that fire is to go through the fire and, and experience the fire and then get away and get to safety. It's a very, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's, it kind of goes into, and I can't, Prashit uh, Iyengar. Um, I think he's the grandchild of BKS Angar. Um, he had a little saying, it's, it goes like this. Um, I can't teach you what you don't know. What you don't know may be happening. And what is happening is way more profound than you know. And so the whole point of that is cultivate the happening. If I stay in the burning building, I'm no longer going to be able to cultivate any happening because my happening ends there. It's still a solution. Right. It's just not the effective one that we're looking for, maybe. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, so I, we, we, we've kind of naturally evolved into um, this, this area where yoga, I, 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 don't, I don't know how many of the people listening know, that, know this. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but many people don't realize that yoga is a, actually a form of meditation. The, actually, yoga is, that's, so, yes, yoga was originally looked at as a science, you figure, thousands of years ago, because how do we control our, they looked at it as how do we control our mind, and then yeah. after practicing, sitting to try to control their mind, they realized different things, they realized that there were maybe eight limbs that we need to look at. And they all want to come to culminate into bliss. There are many forms to get to there. There's the karma way of doing it. There's the, uh, the contemplation way. Um, there's the Hatha way, which is the postures way, which is actually, I'm learning now, came later. But yes, yoga, I mean, if you look at any time that you are in the moment, whether... Whether it, you could say washing dishes is mindful as long, or meditation, right. as long as you're in the moment. That's right. Um, and that's why I tell. And that's why I tell people. I said, you know, they say you can't meditate. Well, what do you mean you can't meditate? Well, my mind doesn't want to stop. And I'm like, well, haven't don't you do a job where you have to focus on that particular task? to the best of your ability and nothing else. And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, you meditated there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just you're, you've done it in a more focused way. That's right. And, and then what the other, I think what the challenge is, is people now they have to sit with themselves. And I know that's for me because I could sit and focus on a task that I have to do because it's outside of me. But then when it's just me and the universe, it's a little yeah. different. Yeah. Because it's kind of scary. What is it that I'm going to encounter? Because I don't know. I've never been there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And to to go back on what you just said just a second ago, I, um, I actually am launching a, a, a new course on the role of meditation and holistic healing. And one of the points that I make in, in the course itself is that there are are two types of meditation. I mean, there, there are several different types, but there are two basic types. There is focus or control meditation and contact meditation, 
which the first one you have to you have to experience the first one to get to the second one. You have to to, to learn to focus to be able to do to to stay aware while you're wa washing dishes to do yoga, focus on the poses, those type things. Whether you're gardening, you're focusing on the moment, and then you learn to sh to really shut out the noise a little bit, so to speak, or 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 to become actually into a line in harmony. But once we re we can. Once we acknowledge that the noise is there and we're able to separate from the noise and, and separate from our ego and separate from our identity, then we can move inward, which is where the contact happens. That's where you begin to get in touch with your intuition. There's a lot of phrases that, that people throw around, um, you know, with, with the higher consciousness, with uh, spirit, with God, whatever people want to say. I'm not here to give a religious lecture, but... The, the point is, is to get you have to you have to go through the focus phase of it to to train your mind before you can go deeper and really get in touch with your intuition. That's when that's when the peace really starts to set in. Would you agree with that? No, I, I, absolutely. It, it yeah, I'm just sitting here going through the different limbs of yoga. Um, you know, I follow the Ashtanga, which is the eight limbs of yoga. Okay. The first one being the self conduct or or morals. Second one is self conduct. Um, with that, you have basically five sub limbs, which are, I'm not going to get into them, but they're like the Ten Commandments. I'd look at it as this way: just don't be a dick. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's you know, uh, um, golden rule, right? Yeah, I mean, um, and then that's limbs one and two. Limb three is your postures. Limb four is your breath control. Limb five is your sense control. Limb six is concentration. Limb seven is meditation. And then limb eight is your bliss or what they call samdhi. So you look at it and, and the study that I found is it says that, you know, concentration culminates into meditation and meditation is the culmination of concentration. Just like what you're saying, you have to focus. Once you focus or once you learn to concentrate, then you can meditate. But until then, and, and meditating is where you're going to find all that inner stuff that is going to lead you to that blissful state. Yeah. Um, and that's why, like, I rest meditation because I don't have to. I just have to lay there. If I fall asleep, I fall asleep. It's great. <laughs> and with 95% of the people in I rest meditation do fall asleep. It comes from an ancient practice called Yoga Nidra. Um, which is Nidra, N-I-D-R-A, is the Sanskrit word for sleep. Or that awareness that you talked about. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Walter Reed and um, the DOD realized that Yoga Nidra was good for PTSD and hypervigilance about 30 years ago. Well, 30 years ago, the stigmatism of yoga or anything with a Sanskrit word was... Right. All, I mean, off the charts. They 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 told this guy, uh, Rich, Doctor Richard Miller, "Hey, name it something else." And you know what? It's kind of got some dirty hippie stuff. Kind of cleanses it up because you know we got our military warriors that are going to be going through this. So he came up with a ten-step protocol called IRES: little I, big R, and then EST, little EST. Okay. Um, a lot of people think because they fall asleep while they're resting their eyes kind of does but actually i stands for integrative and the rest stands for restorative okay um, or restoration so integrative restoration so it integrates everything that makes up who you are to restore you back to who you truly are i love it and that's when you talk about mindfulness and awareness you focus on something and then when you start to and you can focus on it then you start to get into the meditation part of it or the inner workings, the mindfulness of it, to where you can say, "Okay, this is who I truly am," yeah. based upon what I'm contemplating on. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So let's let's roll with that. Let's let's go backwards a little bit. Okay. So, um, because I, I want I want to be very clear to the people listening about about the advantages of this. Okay. So I. My my uh, most of my listeners at this point, they know that I, I I've started to become very open about uh, some of the traumatic things that happened to me in my childhood, and I'm, I'm I'm finishing up my book right now to kind of go through that. I had I had a lot of trauma as a child, and it it manifested into some very destructive behavior 
uh, from that started manifesting probably about the age of 15 that went to about to my late 20s um, until I finally became aware. I, I, I became aware and I, I understood that once the awareness happened, everything, not that it was easy, but that was the beginning of, of the path. So your, I want to talk about your story a little bit. I want people to, to uh, and I want you to tell what you're comfortable telling, what you're comfortable talking about. With, I, I want people to understand that that this isn't this isn't something you just happened to. I mean, you may have just happened to fall into, but you you've had a long arduous journey that was filled with a lot of darkness and a lot. I think you used the word demons at the very beginning. That you've had an arduous journey as well, and I I want you to tell tell us what you can or what you want to tell us. To, to shine the disparity between where you were and where you are now. So in my darkest days, if I only spent $30 on crack cocaine, that was a bad day. Wow. That was a low day. Today, um, I'm not saying I don't think of it. Obviously, it's there. Um, but, you know, teaching, if you'd asked me five years ago when I came to yoga, if I'd be doing teaching six live stream classes in the middle of an ep you know, pandemic, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I would have said, you guys are crazy. Yeah. I just want to be able to figure out a way to not indulge this demon at all, of every route, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Now, before my purpose was, how could I not feel? Now my purpose is, I want to feel it all, but I want everybody to know or be able to experience the joy of feeling once you realize it's an okay thing. But you got to realize it's an okay thing, because if you'd asked me to feel when I first came to yoga, I would have said, no, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, and um, it's called disassociation, you know. It's also a byproduct of trauma, where we, we disconnect from our, our feelings and our emotions to protect. Uh, you know, the, the, the mind can only take so much, and uh, it's the area of compassion in the brain, and it can only take so much before it has to start moving to other areas of the brain and, and, and not allowing that, that those emotions. It becomes disassociation. People disassociate in many, many ways. Unfortunately, drugs and alcohol are probably the most uh, prominence were probably the one that most people think about so um but I, I think it's i think it's remarkable and and i want people to, to understand that this is you know you're a yoga instructor but this someone who's who's dealing with ptsd from either their childhood or uh, a combat veteran um you know an interesting thing i want to switch i, I want to bring this up real quick the interesting thing about combat veterans is is that the you know, according to Carl Jung, Carl Jung, Jungian psychology, the PTSD, I think, is a um, PTSD, I think, it, it varies for different people. But I think in combat veterans, one of the problems with, with that is, is that you take fine, young, upstanding, normal predominantly males, but now I know that's changed. You take these people who are normal people who like to have a good time and they have a family and they love their grandma and they love their dog. And and then all of a sudden they go out and you make them do these horrendous things and they see these horrendous things that they didn't know existed. And because they grew up in an isolated shelter of believing that they were one way and life was one way. And then the 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 curtains thrown back and they see that the evil and the ugliness in the world that I think the mind has a hard time reconciling those two. And when it does that, it creates this perpetual something is wrong with me because I did this or something's wrong with me because I, I participated in this or something's wrong with me because I didn't stop this from happening or because I witnessed it. And I think that that, that irrecon irreconcilable difference in the mind causes such a disruption that that causes part of the PTSD. Now, I had different experiences than you do because I wasn't, I was in the military, but I wasn't a combat veteran. So I'm going to ask you what you think about, what you think about that, that idea that I just, I just posed. Oh, absolutely.
absolutely, because um, that is part of the kind of the, the trauma that I, I went through that I got into it with another captain and I ended up choke slamming him in front of the entire headquarters company. Now, up until that point, I had actually, there was a bronze star. And if anybody knows what a bronze star is, that's like, you can only get a bronze star during wartime, but it was either signed by the general or on his desk to be signed or, you know, waiting to be signed. And that got thrown out. So there were many, many, many years that I went through and, and up until probably two or three years ago that I even beat myself up over that all the time. Um, and what if that, you know, talking about the, the mind going a hundred miles an hour, what if in that scenario, like what if I, that had never happened? Yeah. Where would I be today? Right. Type thing. And then the abandonment sets in. You feel like you're on your own. The army's left you behind. The VA system's not working for you. Um, oh, it goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. It never ends. Yeah. And I got to look at it, you know, that happened in the past, and that was not a very effective way to deal with what was going on. Yeah. And that's okay, because I'm human, just like the rest of us. That's right. But I know what my mission is now, and it has nothing to do with that incident that happened 20 years ago. That's right. That's right. Or 15 years ago, whatever it was. Good. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it could, because your past shouldn't define you. The only thing that should define you is the person, I, and I believe this, there, this is... Obviously, this is a, a long and detailed debate, but I believe that the only thing that matters is the person that you want to be right now. It's not necessarily the person that you are. It's not the things that have happened to you. It's the, your mindset of who you want to be, and are you moving towards that? And I, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of credibility uh, that goes along with that. And I think really what's helped me with that, and it's a it's the only place that I've ever found it to word it like that is through yoga or like this, excuse me. And what I want to be, instead of saying what I want to be, you stated as I am that. Yeah. Because in mindfulness and in yoga, we want to be. And if you look at, if you're being, there is no past and there is no future. There only is the here and now. So instead of saying, I intend to be peaceful, it would be, I am peaceful. That's right. And just that, that confirmation, and that could be a mantra, even let like that could be a meditation. And you just sit there and say whatever it is that you envision yourself to be, but you state it in the present tense or as the truth. And you, that's your meditation every morning. You do that for 10 minutes a day. Agreed. Agreed completely. When I work with, uh, I'm a holistic life coach and I'm a trauma recovery coach. And when I work with my clients, I always begin with the end of mind, and I, 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 I invite them to look forward. And when, when, when they're old and when they die, what do they want their obituary to look like? What do they, what do they want people to say about them? And then we reverse engineer it back to the present of where they are now. And so that's why I said what I said about who you want to be, because it, the, we're both on the same page. The, the only moment that exists is the one right now. Everything else are just electrical and chemical processes in your brain. Your memories are stored. The future is anxiety. You haven't even gotten there yet. The only thing that matters is, is what you're doing right now. But I think if you have a target vision of who you want to be and then you can manifest that in the now, then that, that's, that's the best way to go with that. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, want, I, I want to be clear again to anyone listening that, um, you know, you don't have to be a yoga instructor, Right. That, no, absolutely not. But this is a, this is a path to healing, right? Um, you never expected to be a yoga instructor. You just started to do yoga, and you started to feel better, and started to to have a more positive outlook on life. And, and, and correct, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it. This is what I tell people: your your path may not be yoga, but yet. I guarantee you, if you stay mindful, you will stay in your path. Yeah. Well, you don't know if it's yoga until you try. Right. I mean, there's a... Everyone of Forrest's classes. 
Well, yeah, I, yoga with forest.com. It's one R because I spell my name with one R. I don't run. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's why I tell people, no, it's not run forest, run. It's yoga forest, yoga. There's got to be a, uh, there's got to be a commercial there. Yoga, yoga forest, yoga. There we go. I, I've, I've already started it, so I'll figure it out somewhere or another. Maybe yeah. Put them on, on yeah. Advertising. That'll be a good one. I like that, Brad. For sure. For sure. So, um, all right. So, Yoga with Forest with one R. Right. Right. You get. I have on Facebook. That's just Yoga with Forest. I have a website, yogawithforest.com. You can go to the yoga schedule. Um, everything is live streamed right now, so it doesn't matter where you're at. You can take one of my classes. Okay. Um, you just have to go on to that whatever studio that's offering it, or this you know, um, and and purchase it through them. They're offering some really discounted rates right now with everything going on, so it's worth checking into. Um, I do have Instagram, but I'm not quite as savvy on that. But that's all lowercase yoga underscore with underscore forest. Okay. Okay. Well, what I what I will do is I will put. Uh, we are in the process of putting all my podcasts on my website, and then on my website I will I will get with you and we'll put the information you want to put up there for anyone who's interested in checking it out. They can just go to uh, thebradleyhall.com and uh, find the podcast and then then get all your links and look you up from there. Perfect. Sounds like plan. Sounds great, Brad. I appreciate this uh, opportunity. I'm very grateful. To be able to share my story and whatever insight that I had today. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm also appreciative. I'm very grateful, and I hope um, you know. As this, as this, we hope this. Obviously, we hope this, uh, this expands and grows. And I'd love to have you back. We, have, we, I, we have so many things we can talk about. We just merely scratched the surface. I'm sure. Um, well, yoga is a thousand petaled lotus. I like to say thousand headed serpent, but. People they they, they they don't they don't take the serpents as well as lotuses for some reason. I don't know yeah. why. But. Not in the West, that's for sure. Uh, okay. Well, cool. I, I appreciate you uh, joining me again, and uh, we'll have you back soon. I promise. Awesome, Brad. You have a good one, and uh, give your uh, wife a hug for me, man. Will I will, man. Take care of yourself. Hello. All right, buddy. Thanks. Bye now. Bye bye. Hello. Is anyone here? Hello. Hello. Oh, oh, hi. There you are. I've been looking all over for you. I want to thank you for listening uh, today. I also want to tell you, if you haven't checked out my website lately, uh, you should do that. It's www.thebradleyhall.com. Just to remind you, I am a holistic life coach. A certified mindfulness instructor. And I am a trauma recovery coach. And in these uncertain times, sometimes we just need someone to talk to, to help us clear our thoughts, help us organize our thoughts, and help us map out a clear direction of where we want to go to help us navigate through the obstacles that we we may encounter through daily life. And I'm here to do that for you. So check out my website. I've got plenty of free content uh, on my my website, also on my YouTube channel, which is The Bradley Hall. And... uh, the health preacher. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. So thanks again for listening. We appreciate your support. And until then, take care of yourself.